we scale differently. We scale vertically. And what that means is we don't invest in that many companies. So the accelerator does about 20 companies a year, you know, 20 times less than, than what YC or, or Pixar does. But instead of just writing one check, we'll write four, five, six checks into the same company over the next two, three years. The startup investment landscape is changing and world-class companies are being built outside of Silicon Valley. We find them, talk with them, and discuss the upside of investing in them. Welcome to Upside. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Upside Podcast, the first podcast finding upside outside of Silicon Valley. I'm Jay Klaus, and I'm accompanied by my co-host, Mr. Soon to finally be married himself, Eric Hornung. How many times have we used the marriage nickname on this podcast? I think I've been engaged almost as long as this podcast has been around. Yeah, well, you know, I have a rule that I will only use the same nickname once every couple of months. And yeah, you've, you've been engaged for a long time. How long have you been engaged? July 17th, 2019, I believe is the day. Or 16th, 17th, 18th. I think it was the 17th. I think I, I, think I nailed that. Mallory and I have been getting some heat for not yet having a date for our wedding and being mm. engaged now for five months. People think that's weird. When you get engaged, listeners, if you ever get engaged, if you are engaged, if you have been engaged, you may or may not know this, but the second that you propose, there is no question that anyone asks you other than, do you have a date? It is constant. Why is that? Are they... Are they nosy? Are they supportive? Do they want to come to the wedding? Is it just like this social script that now we have in our heads as to when I hear X, I respond Y. X is I'm engaged. Y is do you have a date yet? What is it? Why, what is it with people? It's probably some layer of social conditioning. But I think people also just want to envision the wedding. And they know this is what a summer wedding looks like. If you give them a summer date, this is what a winter wedding looks like. And there's a canned response to each of those as well. Oh, summer wedding. That's going to be beautiful. Are you doing it outside? Oh, winter wedding. Those are gorgeous. You know, like, oh, fall wedding, beautiful weather, spring wedding. Oh, new season. Like, you know, there's just like, I feel like there's a uh, second layer to that question, which gives you a visual imagery once you have the date of what the wedding's going to be like. The line of questioning feels a little bit similar to the line of questioning after you tell someone that you've got into contract on a home. And I'm going to be the cynical person to say that I think a lot of times people are playing comparison and they want to be excited for you, but they also want to know that their wedding was better. Mm, maybe. I might depend on the age of the person because some people are older when they ask you and just want to genuinely be happy about a wedding. And maybe that's a bad comparison on age, but that's probably true. And I like the co comparison to the home because the amount of people who asked me for my address of my new home oh, was yeah. higher, much higher than I thought it would be. They're going straight to Zillow. They're saying, let me see this house. Let me see the value of this house. I got to know. Yep. Engagements, buying houses. These are just natural stages that people take when they're trying to live the one life they have to live the best way that they can. And if you want to live the one life you have the best way you can, like Jay and I, getting engaged, buying houses, you can go check out our friends at Ethos Wealth Management. You can go to upside.fm slash ethos, E-T-H-O-S, to learn more. Well, Eric, in your personal life, you may no longer be flying solo, but for this interview today, you are flying solo, I'm afraid, talking to our new friend, William Sue. I always get a little nervous going into an interview without you, Jay. Will is the founding partner of the Santa Monica-based fund Mucker Capital. Way back in the day, we spoke with Monique Villa, who is an investor at Mucker Capital. And Will is the co-founder and partner. He started his career as a founder creating BuildPoint, a provider of workflow management solutions for the commercial construction industry not long after graduating from Stanford. In previous to Mucker Capital, he was the SVP and Chief Product Officer of AT&T Interactive. So pretty crazy backstory here, Eric, and I'm jealous I'm not going to spend some time chatting with you and Will to learn a little bit more about it. I feel like Mucker made the news not too long ago with the acquisition of Honey and how early they were in. I think that was like a $4 billion acquisition or something crazy. But Jay, I got a question for you. I got to advocate for the listener here. 
This is a California VC. What are we doing with them on the podcast? Well, they are California based. They're based in Los Angeles and they invest in Southern California and other similarly underfunded ecosystems outside of Silicon Valley. That is their focus. They, in fact, invested in TribeVest. TribeVest is going through Mucker Lab. And when we had Travis on the show, he just had really glowing positive things to say about his experience working with Mucker and Will. And so we thought, you know what? That checks the boxes for us. If this checks the boxes for you, dear listener, you can reach out to us at Upside FM on Twitter or send us something a little longer at hello at upside.fm and we will get to that interview with just me, no Jay, right after this. Eric, we got to make some big changes to how we do operations here at Upside. This feels like an intervention, Jay. It's a bit of an intervention. I have to give you some tough love. We've had some calendar problems over the last couple of weeks. I've had some calendar problems. You don't have to throw the third person on this. I do like to take the blame for you, but this one is on you. And Eric, I think we have found a solution to our calendar and scheduling problems. But there are 101 scheduling tools out there, Jay, that can help you avoid the awkward dance of finding a time to meet. But this tool is by far and away the best one I've seen, and I have looked at a lot of scheduling tools. And I am talking about Savvy Cow. Savvy Cal makes it a collaborative effort allowing you to personalize links and allow recipients to overlay their own calendar on top of yours. It's going to make booking guests for upside and even just one-on-one conversations a complete breeze. You got to see what this looks like. You got to see how it works because you're going to ask, why wasn't it always this easy? You can sign up for a free account at SavvyCal.com slash upside. That's S-A-V-V-Y-C-A-L dot com slash upside. And when you are ready to test out a paid plan, use the code UPSIDE to get your first month free. All right, well, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Eric. I'm, I'm excited to be here. I think this might be like my second or third try at, the, at a podcasting, so I'm relatively... Uh, uh, really in this thing. Most of our guests uh, on Upside are actually pretty early. Actually, 60% of them have never been on a podcast or featured in a news article before. So oh, wow. you're uh, hopefully in good hands here. Yeah, no, I'm like I was telling you a little bit earlier, I'm hoping for the uh, post-production magic to make me sound like George Clooney and, and uh, smart as uh, Mike Moritz. <laughs> on Upside, we'd like to start with a background of the guests. So can you tell us, take us on a quick rocket ship through your history? Sure. There are times it takes me about half an hour to just talk about my history, but this time I'll try to be as fast as I can, but feel free to cut me off. I was born in Taiwan and immigrated to the U.S. when I was 10. Learned English here, here kind of growing up. Luckily for me, Taiwan was very much of a tech city or tech island, if you will. And my father was the tech industry. And the city I ended up landing at was San Jose. Actually, this town called Saratoga, right next to San Jose and Cupertino. So I grew up biking around all the Apple buildings and going to Best Buy and Fry's. We just went out of business. I actually shed a tear that day, kind of building my own computers. So like, kind of computers has been part of my life since like literally the day I started speaking English. And for me, the, the tech industry wasn't this thing that wasn't like, very intangible and aspirational. It was actually part of my daily life. So going on the path that I'm in is really just a continuation of both the legacy of my family, as well as kind of just the inverse of nature of how I was brought up. I was supposed to follow, uh, follow in my father's footsteps and uh, study industrial engineering and go manage factories and make widgets. And being the rebel Taiwanese kid that I was, I ended up on the software side of the world. So I went to Stanford in 98 and kind of landed in the middle of the dot-com bubble. I worked for about 10 months at an investment bank in Palo Alto, helping companies like Amazon, Commerce One. I think I did like 10 IPOs in 10 months uh, going public. I was an engineer, so I barely knew how to work a spreadsheet. Like if you ask me about MATLAB or SAS, I can program. But like a spreadsheet, I was like, oh, like this is half a programming language. What's going on? So I was actually a terrible banker. One of the things I was really bad at which I never knew was a disability, was that I could not see different fonts on the same page. To me, they all looked the same. 
And at an investment bank, presentation is super important. So I came up with this presentation that have like an Ariel and Times Roman and Ukraine are all on the same page. And it would just freak everybody out. And I just couldn't see it. I literally could not see the difference. Like there's such a thing of font blindness. That's probably me. To be very blunt, I was a terrible investment banking analyst, but I was also a bit naive and aggressive and uh, somewhat aspirational. So um, at 22, 10 months into my first job, I quit uh, the investment bank and started my own uh, internet company. I went out with a few of my friends from the bank and from Stanford, and we raised $55 million in less than 12 months on a deck with nothing. And at the time, I thought I was like the smartest guy on Sand Hill Road. Like, why is everybody throwing money at me? But looking back, uh, it has very little to do with who Will is or more what he looks like. I think everybody thought I was Jerry Yang's little brother, like a Taiwanese immigrant from Stanford. So therefore, like, yeah, like Yahoo just made people a couple billion dollars each. So why wouldn't Will? Turned out I was uh, one one hundredth of what Jerry Yang was. I was a terrible entrepreneur. I didn't know how to actually build a company. I knew how to build a product, but I didn't know how to build a company. Looking back, you know, I was also investing in, in, in BillPoint. I started out out of freaked. We had about 700 employees. 400 of them were salespeople. We had offices across the US. I think we had 40 different offices. And we were selling a product that we gave away for free. Uh, think about your in economics. I was probably losing probably $100,000 per customer. So we were scaling really fast, but the business was completely upside down and we just relied on fundraising, which I was really good at, to continue to kind of build the business. Turns out it's much more important to get money from your customers than get money from VCs. Lesson number one. And therefore, when the market crashed in 2001, the VCs looked around the room and said, holy shit, there's no way we can buy more, get more money anymore. And we really need to get some gray-haired white guys into the room <laughs> and, uh, and and turn this company around. So uh, I, I was told to uh, never show up to the office ever again in a single meeting. And I think the statue... Were those, were those exact words? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Like, be the chairman. We're going to take away the shares that you have. We're going to recap the company and you know, don't come back. You're going to be a distraction to the team. Being, I think this, uh, I mentioned, I think the statute of limitation has gone. So in the rebellious, young, kind of pissed off way, the only thing I could think of to get back at my, uh, my investors was to steal the Aeron chair <laughs> that, that I had at the office. I put it in the back of my, uh, my sedan and I just drove away with it. And then that was, that was me at Bill Point. Uh, that was, that was the breakup. You know, sometimes you, uh, you need a momento. My momento was my Aeron chair. It was both an example of the excess of the internet dot com boom, uh, was as well as the the permanence of an iconic permanence of something that came from that era, right? Like it's both a representation of something amazing and great, as well as something that's like completely irrational and stupid. And I, I I still have that iron chair. It's it's where my little daughter sits and do her homework every day. <laughs> How much of the experiences you had at BuildPoint, do you rely on when you're talking with founders today at, at Mucker? Two things I rely on. One from the experience side, all the things not to do. I can identify them right away. Right? Like some people say, well, I'm the founder of you know, DoorDash and therefore like I can help you build a great company. And that's great. And that's that they, you know, people should do that. My pitch is that uh, I was a terrible baseball player, so I know how not to hit the ball. So don't follow my example. <laughs> my, my job is to try to help people reduce the options that's in front of them. Right? I don't tell them to go A, B, C, and D. I tell them, C and D, don't do that. I've done that before. Stay away from C and D. Pick A or B, I don't care, but not C and D. And then the other thing is um, I totally understand how intoxicating being an entrepreneur is and what fundraising feels like and the fact that people report to you and this CEO title. And if you're in your little own bubble rather than looking at the world globally, you know, you think you think you're the king of the hill without realizing that your hill is actually just a little pile of dirt. And you really need to stay a lot more grounded and really understand the customer and build the business step by step. Being the CEO of your startup has nothing it's not even close to being the CEO of GE. Right, like that's on a completely different planet. Don't you dare think that you have made something and 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 
drink your own Kool-Aid and think you're amazing. You're not. That hill can disappear overnight and you'll be the CEO of nothing. And CEO of nothing is no better than being, I don't know, like being a stay-at-home dad, right? Like there's no difference. You gotta, you gotta build something amazing first. And then the title, the accolades, all that stuff is, uh, is only, only matters when you actually have built something special. So I think a lot of people would say that you've built something special at Mucker. I want to take us back to when you were co-founding it in 2011. A lot of people who've had bad experiences with VCs don't go out and then decide to be a VC. What was that decision like? To be honest, being a VC was the last thing on the list of things I want to do before I die. <laughs> to be honest, I have some great investors that I truly still respect today. And I have some that I, I would not even cross the same side of the street with. And the, at the beginning of Mucker, um, and so right before Mucker, I was at this company called AT&T that you might have heard of. Uh, a small little company. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, not $100 billion in valuation, but $100 billion in revenue, right? Now, you might not have the $100 billion in valuation <laughs> uh, or trillion dollar valuation in some of the companies, but as far as the size of the company and the operation of the business and revenue, it was gigantic. And I was an executive at uh, a tiny part, a tiny division within the company, kind of seeing the, how the entire beast works. Um, I learned a lot in my three and a half years there, but uh, I think I was at mid-30s at the time. And I was like, you know, like this can't be the rest of my life because lots of people at the company at at and really view it as like, okay, I'm going to take the next 20 years and try to make my way to CEO of at and by the time I'm 60. I like to be at a beach somewhere and playing with my grandkids at 60. I don't want to be trying to run a public company and getting yelled at by the press. That's not my goal in life. So I was actually leaving at and and trying to kind of come up with an idea and start a company again. Like I, I wanted to go on my comeback tour, if you will. Right? I want to right all the wrongs of, uh, of Bill Point. And certainly I did so many things wrong. And in, in some ways I tell people I destroyed $50 million in value. Right. So it's time in my life to build that value back, pay my debt to society and the economy. My, my partner at the time, Eric, well, he was, uh, he was my, I used to work for Eric at eBay. He came down to LA. He was doing, uh, VC work in the Bay Area. And he's the one who convinced me that starting a fund is the same as starting a company. It's really about taking an opportunity and seeing a problem in the marketplace and coming up with a better product. And for better or for worse, he was very convincing and I bought it that uh, I can be a different type of VC and we can be a different type of firm. And in the market that we're in at the time, only in Southern California, there's a huge gap for what we can provide and what we can give. And we can provide a ton of value and charge much less and provide a lot uh, more outcomes for our customers who are our entrepreneurs. I think that ethos is part of who Marker is. A, that we are a startup, that we are a company. We're not a fund. Fund is our business model. And B, Eric and I, and now Omar, we're entrepreneurs first and foremost. We're building a business. And then our founders, our entrepreneurs, they are our customers. And we offer a product to them, and then we charge them a price. And they need to receive enough value for that price for them to continue to be our customer and so that we can have the right retention and the right metrics and right NPS score. Right? Like we run Marco like a business and we believe our entrepreneurs are our customers. There's this kind of debate in VC on who is the customer, kind of like there is in academia. It's, is it the entrepreneur or is it the LP? So if customers are the L or if your customers are founders and entrepreneurs, what's the LP in this company? metaphor <laughs> uh the lps are the investors just like a company right and value starts with the customer the value is given up by the customer to the company and eventually accrues to the investor and i see that the same way as a firm right we need to provide enough value to our customers so that they give us value back right a, a small percentage of the value that we give to the customer back if i charge $100,000 a year for my software, I better provide at least a million dollars worth of value to my customer. Right? If I give $100,000 to, to a company, I better, uh, I better give a million dollars worth of value. Right? And then 
eventually values flow through to the cap table or in the in this case fund to our investors. But very much it has to start with the company and the entrepreneur. That's where everything is created, right? Like money has no intrinsic value and it doesn't accrue, especially in a deflationary world. The only value is created through hard work and innovation and then disruption. How did you decide on what your first product offering was going to be as Mucker? Um, our first product market, uh, offering was an accelerator. That was our product. I like to think that, well, if people ask me a question, that question, my first answer is we came up with that product because we're good at it. Right? Me and my partner, Eric, have the network in the Bay Area to help entrepreneurs with kind of meeting entrepreneurs they need to meet and meeting on investors they want to meet. We have built enough product and, and, and uh, companies in our lifetime to kind of provide that advice. So there is a lot of product founder fit and market founder fit in who we are and building an accelerator. The other thing that actually happened is that uh, we were forced to be an accelerator. Eric and I started Mucker with a million dollars of our own money, plus a little bit of funds for to family. We are a million dollar fund when you guys just started. And like, there are like engineers at Google that makes more in one month than, I, than we have like total as a fund. So we were forced to go as early as we can and provide as much value outside of the capital that we have as we can because we literally had no money. So we were painted into a corner. So when you're painted into a corner, you have to do what you're best at. Um, and that's what we're best at. Right? Like if you're 5'7 and you want to play football in an NFL, like you better be Julian Edelman. You, you're not going to be Terrell Owens. Right? And, and we'll take the hits and we'll, we'll, we'll find those creases and we'll, play the, we'll, we'll get our hands dirty. And that's what we're forced to do. And thank God we're good at how has that I, and I, maybe a point of clarification here is Mucker Lab that first accelerator or is Mucker Lab an evolution? Mucker Lab is the first uh, first iteration of Mucker. There wasn't Mucker Capital yet. We were purely doing in 2011. We were too purely in an accelerator, and at the time, writing twenty thousand dollar checks just like Y Combinator. So a million dollars is a lot if you write $20,000 checks. It's not much money if you're writing $100,000 checks. So uh, uh, we, we were, well, that's all we could do, write $20,000 checks and roll our sleeps and make sure that we add as much value as we can through the work and our network rather than through our capital. How has Mucker Lab evolved over the last decade? Yeah, so um, certainly who, who Mucker is today from the outside in doesn't look much like who we are were 10 years ago. And that's good. We improved and gotten bigger because we've been successful. But the ethos of who, what Mucker Lab is, uh, is, is who we are every day. Right? And that means a few things. It means that we, we go, uh, if, okay, so a little bit of who we are now, right? Remember a million dollars 10 years ago? Today, we have over $250 million in our most current fund. We write checks anywhere from 150K in the accelerator, which we still run today, all the way up to five million dollars, closer to kind of an early Series A round. We have an office in LA where I'm standing at right now. We have an office in Nashville, an office in Austin, and we'll have more offices across the US. About sixty percent of the portfolio in the last two years is actually outside of California. And then we barely, if any, do any deals in the Bay Area. We have completely kind of forsaken our past <laughs> as kind of barrier kids <laughs> and now really embrace this ethos of like uh, hand-to-hand combat when it comes to building companies. So we are a venture fund in the truest sense of the world. We write large checks into companies and we invest all the way to you know, a couple million dollars in recurring revenue if you're a SaaS company, right? So, but how we work with companies, uh, what we expect from our founders is still the same. When we write a $5 million check, we treat it like an accelerator investment. Right? Like uh, my expertise is not just like building a company zero to three. It's also how do you get to three to four? How to build the VP of sales? How to find the right sales compensation structure? How to kind of uh, build your go to market motion? What is the handoff between the, the SDR versus the AE? Right. Or how do you build a, a branding campaign and run a scale Facebook ad? Right. Like all these stuff that we've done. When we have to do for our accelerated companies, we will do for our even later stage investments. And this speaks to kind of the ethos of the firm and even the new partner we added, right? Two years ago, uh, Omar Hamoy joined the firm as the third partner of Marker Capital. Omar is here not because he used to be a partner at Sequoia. I don't give a fuck about 
Oops. <laughs> it's okay. You can swear. Yeah. I don't give a fuck about Sequoia in the context of the brand. Certainly they're the most amazing venture fund and there's lots to learn to be like that. Right. Like there's an aspirational aspect to what I do when I look at them. But as far as the brand's concerned, I don't really care. Right. That Omar used to work at part, uh, at Sequoia. What I really cared about was that Omar's from LA and he built Amok initially in LA before moving to the Bay Area that he has this ethos of I'm going to bootstrap my first startup. Right. And uh, somewhere along the way, I found so much success that Sequoia was forced to invest in me. And then now I'm one of the most iconic entrepreneurs in, in kind of this current boom. I call it kind of web 2.0 or dot com 2.0. Right. If you really think about it, Amop kind of kicked off this mobile revolution where everybody's making a ton of money around. So it is about his founder background, his operating background, and really his ethos that matches exactly to who we are. And that's why I'm, you know, we're so excited to have him here. And you know, two years later, he, he talks and thinks just like us. And uh, although he doesn't swear like me, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Take me back to that ethos. You, you mentioned we treat every investment like it's an accelerator investment. When I think about accelerators, I think that they are operationally intensive for the staff that is running them. How do you think about balancing scale? You know, you're 250 million now, you're making more and more investments with the need to like provide that operational level of support. Yeah, uh, I think uh, this is one way that we're different from other accelerators. Techstar, YC, which have kind of perfected the model and, and made a lot of money for the LPs, the way that they scale is horizontally, right? YC says, everybody come to the barrier, come to the capital of uh, innovation and become one of us, right? And then Techstar goes, we'll go to you. Innovation is diffusing and we'll go to you and help you build your company wherever you are. But in either case, uh, they work with something like 500 companies a year. And that's how they deploy their billions or hundreds of million dollars of capital, right? YC, most people don't know or don't care to know is, you know, a billion and a half venture fund now. And that's how they scale. They scale horizontally. We scale differently. We scale vertically. And what that means is we don't invest in that many companies. So the accelerator does about 20 companies a year, you know, 20 times less than, than what YC or, or Pixar does. But instead of just writing one check, we'll write four, five, six checks into the same company over the next two, three years. Uh, I'll say we see them grow. So for us to be successful, it's not, we need to have 90, if not 95% of our accelerator investments get to the next stage and the stage after that. So we can put more and more money to work. It's critically important that we want to make an investment. Every company works out. Otherwise, we just don't have enough you know, bets on the roulette table, if you will, to actually survive. So we can't play roulette. We actually have to rig the game and cheat and actually help the entrepreneurs and help our companies become more successful. If you're a YC and a Y Combinator, a y Combinator and Techstars, Certainly, they add a lot of value, but in the end of the day, their math is if the top 10% of their companies become unicorns, they make a lot of money for their investors and themselves. For us, uh, that ratio has to be much, much, much higher. But that's great because that's our ethos too, right? We don't want to treat entrepreneurs like a number or a percentage. I want to treat every entrepreneur like this is his only company and my only company. Entrepreneurs don't have four companies that are running at any given time. This company needs to work, and I want him to work no matter what. And this is why um, our accelerator companies often stay with us, I'll say on average, about a year. So it's not a three-month program. And then we have accelerator companies that I've been working with since 2017. They haven't gone to the next step. It's not a proud thing to say that, my God, this company has been an accelerator for almost four years. But it is said to said that like as long as entrepreneurs not giving up, we're not gonna give up either. Like there's no such thing as like oh, okay now that you didn't find product market fit, off to the next cohort, goodbye. Like we are still here fighting the good fight and getting our hands dirty and rolling in the dirt and and trying to get out from from the mud to get to some sort of safe velocity and and help you get there. How patient can you be? Like if someone, if it was a MailChimp style 17 year story. Could you guys sit there and let them be in an accelerator for eight, nine years as they iterated their way to figuring out how something worked? For sure we could, but you know, if a MailChimp at some point found product market fit, 
right, and got to possibility. Yeah. By then, if I'm still in their face as much as I am now, I'm kind of annoying. That's a nuisance, right? So yes, I have companies that never raised venture capital after Marker Lab and now is doing, you know, five, six million dollars in AR. Some point in the way, about a year, two years in, they found product market fit. The company is really profitable and, and has all the resources they need to scale. I'll take a step back, right? Like, if the company is still struggling to get product market fit and it's five years in, I will still be there. For better or for worse, oftentimes entrepreneurs have already given up by then. So it's not a very common use case. But if the entrepreneur still hasn't given up and the company has some product market fit that is generating enough revenue to break even, we just haven't found uh, exact velocity, for sure we're still there. We're not going to give up. How do you think about pre-selection screening for that kind of grit, that not give up bidness. <laughs> like, how do you guys actually make a decision on we're all in on this person idea, whatever it is? Three things. First, we try to talk to the founders about their story and how they got here and the adversity they face in their lives, right? And we're looking for failure. We're looking for persistence. We're not looking for privilege. We're not looking for presumed excellence, logos of where you worked and where you went to school. Second thing, we give our entrepreneurs homework during the due diligence process, and we want to see how they react to us giving them work. Some entrepreneurs like, what? Like, I'm just asking for money. I'm not asking for more work. And they disappear or they fight back. Some entrepreneurs take it gladly, but doesn't execute as fast as we like them to, or doesn't doesn't have the right intellectual curiosity and honesty to actually look at the data and make a different decision than they presumed about their business. And then the last thing is, uh, I, I call it kind of the expectation outcome. When people expect you to be amazing, excellent, and smart, and they tell it to your face, you become that person. So we treat our entrepreneurs like they're that good, full, and, and amazing, and, and smart. And more often than not, they are. And they become that person, right? Like, uh, I believe in the carrot much more than the, than the stick. And if you, if you tell people that they are who they can become, and they will become that person. And I very much believe in the greater good of kind of humankind and that we have capacity for, for, for excellence. So instead of presuming kind of guilt and, and kind of lack of skills, we, we just move forward and eventually they get it. And the environment of Mucker, of our founders, of the office, of our brand, it really just attracts that type of people in the first place. When founders are saying no to Mucker, you issue a term sheet, you're like, you're our, you pass this process, you hit these three buckets, we're excited about it. Founder says no. Why? What's the most likely reason? People say no to us all the time. I know lots of VCs don't want to like they want to say like we're just like Harvard and our yield is ninety nine point nine 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 percent. If we give a term sheet, everybody says yes because we're so amazing. Oh my god, people say no to us all the time, all the time. I'll say like maybe thirty forty percent of the time they say no to us, and that's okay, right? Like if you're a company and you're trying to sell your product to someone, if thirty percent of the time people say yes, you're freaking amazing. Starting a company is like playing baseball. Hitting three hundred is fucking all stars, right? And that's the way we view it, right? Like people say no to us all the time. The reason they say no typically is because we're very, very expensive. We don't want to compete on price. We don't want people to think that you come here for money and this is the cheapest money available. We want people to walk into the relationship knowing that they sacrifice a lot to get here and therefore they have to invest a lot to make this relationship work. Like I want people that like, I don't know, gave up going to Harvard in order to attend, you know, the local community college because they, you know, they have maybe have a, a family issue that they have to deal with, right? And therefore they will make it work and they, they, they will not take the sacrifice for not. So yes, we are very expensive when it comes to the equity we ask for and the amount of dollars that we invest. We ask for entrepreneurs uh, upfront for a very heavy involvement in our in the way that we work with them. Lots of entrepreneurs are like, wait a minute, it's my fourth time starting a company. I don't need I don't need you in my face telling me to look at this number and that number. That's not our entrepreneur. We don't need to invest in them and they don't need us for sure. So they should say no to us too. We talked about Mucker back in 
2011, we're sitting here in 2021. What's your kind of vision for Mucker, the company in 2031? Uh, I don't actually have much of a vision, actually. I, I know this is the uncompany part of who we are. I don't want to be Tiger Global. I don't want to be Sequoia. The part of me that's, that has you know a lot of testosterone and wants to get famous and get super rich, like that part of me is gone, right? That's, that's the first kind of 25 years of my life. Well, no, 25 years of my career, right? Like now I want to wake up. I want to work with great entrepreneurs. I want them to be successful one step at a time. My, my customers, their the satisfaction of what we do for them. Every single time we get that, it'll work itself out. I, I really feel like in, uh, VC is a services business rather than a widget business. Our goal is 100% about our customers and their satisfaction. And we get rewards from, from their outcome and their, their kind of fulfillment of their dreams, right? Like a good friend of mine is a doctor. And when we talk about our jobs, he, he's always talk about each and every patient. Right. He doesn't talk about the politics of a hospital or when he's going to get promoted to the head of the department. It's about the case that he's working on and how hard it was. And in the end, he cured him or he still hasn't figured out what's wrong and he's trying really hard. Right. Like, I want to get fulfillment from that. Right. Not from like, you know, Mucker has X dollars under management or I'm on the Midas list or whatever other thing that gets me famous and kind of plastered all over the internet. I actually prefer myself not to be on the internet at all. That sounds to me like a terrible existence and lots of hacking risk. Well, if there's one core theme I've taken away from this conversation, it's a relentless focus on the customer. I think that was a thread throughout this and it's something I will take away. This conversation has been awesome, Will. If people want to learn more about you or Mucker or Mucker Lab, where should they go? Shoot me an email william and muckercapital.com that email is on our website again not like vcs where you go oh uh, we make only investments and referrals or our best companies are from referrals our best company came out of nowhere and even since the first day of mucker when we had muckerlab.com all three partners email was on the website you send it as an email we'll for sure read it if it is a coherent email not like a two-line email hey you i want money uh, we'll definitely reply. So we'll, we'll put in as much effort responding to you as you wrote into that email. We very much believe that uh, the, the level playing field is here and we want to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Jay, we need more stories. We need them. The world needs these stories. And the best way to tell stories of local business ecosystems is to join up with the Upside Podcast Network. Jay, what's that? The network is growing. We have three shows on the network now with Upside, When Pigs Fly, and Lay of the Land. We are knee deep in Cleveland and Cincinnati now, but we want to explore other cities more deeply as well. Anywhere in the United States, if you are listening to this or you know someone who wants to launch a podcast exploring the local business economy, the local business ecosystem in that city, reach out to us at network at upside.fm. Let us know what city and what you're thinking. We're a fun group of people to work with. We'll help you structure a show that is ready for the airwaves. And honestly, we give you a ton of creative control. All we ask is that you tell really exciting stories in your local ecosystem, and we want to help you do just that. Nothing but upside in this arrangement. So send us an email, network at upside.fm, and we'll be talking to you soon. All right, Eric, you just spoke to William Sue, the co-founder and partner of Mucker Capital. What stuck out to you from this interview? Just a different structure, a different format, a different philosophy on doing venture. I feel like so often, especially at the early stage, you hear about venture firms going out, investing in 30 companies out of a fund, 10 of them return the capital, one of them is a unicorn. That's the math. That's what you do. Good to go. That's it. This was a little different. And I didn't really understand it from doing my research. But the idea that once you're in Mucker Lab, we're committed to you, no matter how long it takes, we're going to make sure that you get your next raise. We're going to figure it out. It was much more like the selection matters a lot 
but then the commitment and follow through is much more accelerator like, except for you're not ha- doing multiple cohorts. You're just investing in that founder. You pick them and you're going to make that's going to work. So that must mean they put a lot of weight on their decisions for who they bring in that accelerator in the first place, because then they're really tied to it and they're making a huge commitment long term. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there's just a longer term commitment much. It, it was just a different vibe. I got a different vibe from that interview with Will than I have with most VCs generally as well. Seemed like a very caring person. And I, I don't know how to say that a different different way. It was just he was he understood the founder journey and he was it seemed like from the interview just there for founders in all sorts of different aspects. So I I was I was pretty blown away and I think I uh, even mentioned it a couple times on the interview that it wasn't what I was expecting. I know you haven't had a chance to listen to this episode yet so I'm excited for you to go back and hear it. Sitting here as a founder that would be a very attractive value proposition to me this this idea that it's not just a three month boot camp. It's not just a sprint to demo day and good luck. Hope your your wings take off. To me, as a founder, that sounds like a better opportunity to have somebody who is much more invested in my success. I mean, every VC is going to tell you that they're invested in your success and financially, literally they are. But for them to make that type of longer term commitment feels different and would be attractive. So I can see why that would lead to better deal flow and potentially better outcomes because of that. But man, it does sound like a big risk on the front end for Mucker, but they've certainly seen some success with companies like Honey that you pointed out in the beginning. I would also say that our friend, mutual friend here and friend of the podcast, Nick Potts, who is the founder of ScriptDrop, now founder of Gift Health, when he was launching his newest endeavor, Gift Health, he knew that we were connected to Mucker via Monique. But he wanted to see how, if they lived up to what they preached. So he reached out to them cold and they responded quickly, promptly, professionally, and actually ended up investing in his current round, which in, a, in the world of VC, warm intros are so important. And to actually practice what you preach when it comes to cold emails, and they say they read everything and try to get back to you if they pass. I can't imagine that inbox. Wild. Cool story. Well, I'm excited to listen back through this interview and form my own opinions. But do you think that this will be a trend that we see, Eric? Do you think that this will be the way that VC goes because this is the expectations founders will have or because this is what competition in the marketplace will dictate? No, I think it's too hard. I think that there may be funds that strive for it, but I don't think a majority of funds will be able to do this. It's predicated that the math behind it's hard as well. Not only is the tactical application and execution hard, but the math behind the fund economics and how it works out is hard. So you need to be really good at both of those things. I don't, I don't see that v, VC going that way. Well, I'd love to hear your thoughts, dear listener. You can email us hello at upside.fm or tweet at us at upside.fm. Let us know what you think about this model that Mucker Capital has with Mucker Lab and everything they're doing there. We'd love to hear from you. And if there are other innovative venture firms like Mucker that you'd like to hear more about on the show, let us know and we'll try to get them on. Otherwise, we'll talk to you next week. That's all for this week. Thanks for listening. We'd love to hear what you think about this episode. So tweet at us at Upside FM or email us hello at Upside.fm and let us know. You can learn more about us and browse our entire back catalog of episodes at Upside.fm. And if you love our show, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. That goes a long way in helping us bring high quality guests to the show. Rocky and Sylvester. Super underrated, super underpaid. Today I'm gonna get it and there's nothing in my way. About time, about time. I've been out here for a minute, waiting for my chance.